Join the members of the Time Patrol in Poole Anderson's best-selling book, The Guardians of Time. In the first chapter, titled Time Patrol, Poole Anderson introduces Mance Everard, who is inducted into the Time Patrol. His first assignment is a trip to Victorian England, where he attempts to unravel an archaeological mystery. Hmm. Men wanted 21 to 40. Prefers single, military or technical experience, good physique, for high pay work with foreign travel. Engineering Studies Company, 305 East 45th Street, 9 to 12 and 2 to 6. Hmm. The work is, you understand, somewhat unusual, said Mr. Gordon. And confidential. I trust you can keep a secret. Normally, said Mance Everard, depends on what the secret is, of course. Mr. Gordon smiled. It was a curious smile, a closed curve of his lips, which was not quite like any Everard had seen before. He spoke easy, colloquial, general American. We're not spies, if that's what you're thinking, he said. Everard grinned. Sorry, please don't think I've gone as hysterical as the rest of the country. He was a big man with blocky shoulders and a slightly battered face under crew-cut brown hair. His papers lay before him, army discharge, the record of work in several places as a mechanical engineer. Mr. Gordon had seemed barely to glance at them. Independent spirit, said the man behind the desk. I like that. So many of them come cringing in as if they'd be grateful for a kick. I was interested, said Everhard. I've worked abroad, as you can see, and I'd like to travel again. But frankly, I still don't have the faintest idea what your outfit does. We do a good many things, said Mr. Gordon. Let me see. You've been in combat, France and Germany. We're doing work which is, uh, as I've told you, highly confidential. We, uh, <laughs> we're planning to spring a surprise on our competitors, he chuckled. I'll pay you $100 to go in the back room and take a set of tests. It'll last about three hours. If you don't pass, well, that's the end of it. If you do, we'll sign you on, tell you the facts, and start your training. Are you game? Everhard hesitated. He had a feeling of being rushed. Decision. I'll sign on after you've told me what it's all about. As you wish, shrugged Mr. Gordon. Suit yourself. The tests will say whether you're going to or not, you know. We use some very advanced techniques. That, at least, was entirely true. Everhard did not recognize any of the hooded machines that hummed and blinked around him. The questions which the assistant fired at him seemed irrelevant to anything. And what was that metal cap he was supposed to wear on his head? Into what did the wires from it lead? He stole glances at the meter faces, but the letters and numerals were like nothing he had seen before. Not English, French, Russian, Greek, Chinese, anything belonging to 1954 A.D. Perhaps he was already beginning to realize the truth even then. A curious self-knowledge grew in him as the tests proceeded. Manson Emrit Everhard, age 30, one-time lieutenant in the U.S. Army Engineers, design and production experience in America, Sweden, Arabia, still a bachelor, though with increasingly wistful thoughts about his married friends. No current girl, no close ties of any kind. A bit of a bibliophile, a dogged poker player, fondness for sailboats and horses and rifles, a camper and fisherman on his vacations. He had known it all, of course, but only as isolated shards of fact. It was peculiar, this sudden sensing of himself as an integrated organism, this realization that each characteristic was a single inevitable facet of an overall pattern. He came out exhausted and wringing wet. Mr. Gordon swept eyes rapidly over a series of coated sheets which the assistant gave him and flashed improbably white teeth in a broad, satisfied grin. Ah, at last. You'll definitely do. Do for what? Everhard leaned forward, conscious of his pulse picking up. The patrol. Brace yourself. This is going to be a shock. You see, our company, while legitimate enough, is only a front and a source of funds. 
Our real business is patrolling time. The Academy was in the American West. It was also in the Oligocene period, a warm age of forests and grasslands when man's ratty ancestors scuttled away from the tread of giant mammals. It had been built a thousand years ago. It would be maintained for half a million, long enough to graduate as many as the time patrol would require, and then be carefully demolished so that no trace would remain. It was a complex of long, low buildings, smooth curves and shifting colors, spreading over a greensward between enormous ancient trees. Beyond it, hills and woods rolled off to a great brown river, and at night you could sometimes hear the distant squall of a saber tooth. Everhard stepped out of the time shuttle, a big featureless metal box, wishing desperately for some honorable way to go home. It was a small comfort to see the other shuttles, discharging a total of 50-odd young men and women. The recruits moved slowly together, forming an awkward clump. A man of about 25 happened to stand beside him, obviously British from the threadbare tweeds and the long, thin face. He seemed to be hiding a truculent bitterness under his mannered exterior. Hello, said Everard. Might as well get acquainted. He gave his name and origin. Charles Whitcomb, London, 1947, said the other shyly. I was just demobbed, RAF, and this looked like a good chance. Now I wonder. A man strolled in their direction. He was a slender young fellow in a skin-tight gray uniform with a deep blue cloak which seemed to twinkle as if it had stars sewn in. Hello there, and welcome to the Academy. My name is Dard Kelm. I was born in, uh, let me see, 9573, Christian reckoning, but I've made a specialty of your period, which, by the way, extends from 1850 to 2000. You're all from some in-between years. This place has run along different lines from what you've probably been expecting. We don't turn out men en masse, so the elaborate discipline of a classroom or an army is not required. Each of you will have individual as well as general instruction. The variation in aptitudes means that if we're to develop each individual to the fullest, there must be personal guidance. There's little formality here beyond normal courtesy. Now, Dard Kelm concluded, if there aren't any questions, please follow me and I'll get you settled. Each cadet had his own room in the dormitory building. Meals were in a central refectory, but arrangements could be made for private parties. Everhard felt the tension easing within him. A welcoming banquet was held. There was wine and beer. Maybe something had been slipped into the food, for Everhard felt as euphoric as the others. He ended up beating out Boogie on a piano while half a dozen people made the air hideous with attempts at song. Only Charles Whitcomb held back, sipping a moody glass over in a corner by himself. Dard Kelm was tactful and did not try to force him into joining. Everhard decided he was going to like it, but the work and the organization and the purpose were still shadows. Time travel was discovered at a period when the Korite heresiarchy was breaking up, said Kelm in the lecture hall. You'll study the details later on. For now, take my word that it was a turbulent age when commercial and genetic rivalry was a tooth and claw matter between giant combines. Anything went, and the various governments were pawns in a galactic game. The time effect was the byproduct of a search for a means of instantaneous transportation, which some of you will realize requires infinitely discontinuous functions for its mathematical description, as does travel into the past. I won't go into the theory of it now. <clears throat> Naturally, the group which discovered this, the Nine, were aware of the possibilities. Not only commercial, trading, mining, and other enterprises you can readily imagine, but the chance of striking a death blow at their enemies. You see, time is variable. The past can be changed. But then the Donellians appeared. For the first time, his casual, half-humorous air dropped, and he stood there as a man in the presence of the unknowable. He spoke quietly. The Donellians are part of the future, our future, more than a million years ahead of me. 
man has evolved into something impossible to describe. You'll probably never meet a Donnellian. If you ever should, it would be rather a shock. They aren't malignant nor benevolent. They're as far beyond anything we can know or feel as we are beyond those insectivores who are going to be our ancestors. It isn't good to meet that sort of thing face to face. They were simply concerned with protecting their own existence. Time travel was old when they emerged. There had been uncountable opportunities for the foolish and the greedy and the mad to go back and turn history inside out. They did not wish to forbid the travel. It was part of the complex which had led to them, but they had to regulate it. The nine were prevented from carrying out their schemes and the patrol was set up to police the time lanes. Your work will be mostly within your own eras, unless you graduate to unattached status. You'll always be on call. Sometimes you'll help time travelers who've gotten into difficulties one way or another. Sometimes you'll work on missions, the apprehension of would-be political or military or economic conquistadors. I wish all of you luck. The first part of instruction was physical and psychological. Somewhere along the line, Everhard was thoroughly conditioned against revealing anything about the patrol, even hinting at its existence to any unauthorized person. It was simply impossible for him to do so. Tempero, the artificial language with which patrolmen from all ages could communicate without being understood by strangers, was a miracle of logically organized expressiveness. There was the study of history, science, arts, and philosophies, fine details of dialect and mannerism, these last were only for the 1950 to 1975 period. If he had occasion to go elsewhere, he would pick up special instruction from a hypnotic conditioner. It was such machines that made it possible to complete his training in three months. He learned the organization of the patrol. History was divided into milieus, with a head office located in a major city for a selected 20-year period, disguised by some ostensible activities such as commerce and various branch offices. An ordinary attached agent lived as usual in his own time, often with an authentic job. Communication between years was by tiny robot shuttles or by courier. The entire organization was so vast that he could not really appreciate the fact. He had entered something new and exciting. That was all he truly grasped. He made friends with his fellow cadets. They were a congenial bunch, naturally, with the same type being picked for patrollers, bold and intelligent minds. Oddly, it was the silent and morose Whitcomb with whom he struck up the closest friendship. There was something appealing about the Englishman. He was so cultured, such a thoroughly good fellow, and still somehow lost. They were out riding one day on horses whose remote ancestors scampered before their gigantic descendants. Everhard had a rifle in the hope of bagging a shovel tusker he had seen. I wonder we're allowed to hunt, remarked the American. Suppose I shot a saber tooth, which was originally slated to eat one of those pre-human insectivores. Won't that change the whole future? No, said Whitcomb. He had progressed faster in studying the theory of time travel. You see, it's rather as if the continuum were a mesh of tough rubber bands. It isn't easy to distort it. The tendency is always for it to snap back to its uh, former shape. One individual insectivore doesn't matter. It's the total genetic pool of their species which led to man. In the same way, suppose I went back and prevented Booth from killing Lincoln. Unless I took very elaborate precautions, it would probably happen that someone else did the shooting and that Booth got blamed anyway. The resilience of time is the reason travel is permitted at all. If you want to change things, you have to go about it just right and work very hard, usually. His mouth twisted. Indoctrination. We're told again and again that if we interfere, there's going to be punishment for us. I'm not allowed to go back and shoot that ruddy bastard Hitler in his cradle. I'm supposed to let him grow up as he did and start the war and kill my girl. Everhard rode quietly for a while. The only noise was the squeak of saddle leather and the rustle of long grass. Oh, he said at last, I'm sorry, you want to talk about it? Yes, I do, but there isn't much. She was in the WAAF, Mary Nelson. We were going to get married after the war. 
She was in London in 44. November 17th, I'll never forget that date. The V-bombs got her. She'd gone over to a neighbor's house in Streatham. Was on furlough, you see, staying with her mother. That house was blown up. Her own home wasn't scratched. Whitcomb stared emptily before him. It's going to be jolly hard not to, not to go back just a few years and see her at the very least. No, I don't dare. Everhard laid a hand on the man's shoulder awkwardly, and they rode on in silence. The class moved ahead, each at his own pace, but there was enough compensation so that all graduated together. Then each went back to the same year he had come from, the same hour. Mance Everhard, special consultant to Engineering Studies Company, was only to read a dozen papers a day for the indications of time travel he'd been taught to spot and hold himself ready for a call. As it happened, he made his own first job. It was a peculiar feeling to read the headlines and know, more or less, what was coming next. It took the edge off, but added a sadness, for this was a tragic era. He could sympathize with Whitcomb's desire to go back and change history. Only, of course, one man was too limited. He could not change it for the better, except by some freak. Well, he sighed, stoked his pipe, and went over to the bookshelf, picked out a volume more or less at random, and started to read. It was a collection of Victorian and Edwardian stories. A passing reference struck him. Something about a tragedy at Adelton and the singular contents of an ancient British barrow. Nothing more. Hmm. Time travel? He smiled to himself. Still. No, he thought, this is crazy. Well, it wouldn't do any harm to check up, though. The incident was mentioned as occurring in the year 1894 in England. He could get out back files of the London Times, nothing else to do. He was on the steps of the public library as it opened. The account was there, dated June 25th, 1894, and several days following. Adelton was a village in Kent, distinguished chiefly by a Jacobean estate belonging to Lord Wyndham and a barrow of unknown age. The nobleman, an enthusiastic amateur archaeologist, had been excavating it and had uncovered a rather meager burial chamber. A few artifacts nearly rusted and rotted away, bones of men and horses. There was also a chest in surprisingly good condition, containing ingots of an unknown metal presumed to be lead or silver alloy. He fell deathly ill with symptoms of a peculiarly lethal poisoning. Lord Wyndham died, and his family engaged the services of a well-known private detective who was able to show, by most ingenious reasoning, followed by tests on animals, that the deadly emanation from the chest was responsible. Box and contents had been thrown into the English Channel. Everhard sat quietly in the long, hushed room. The story didn't tell enough, but it was highly suggestive, to say the least. Then why hadn't the Victorian office of the patrol investigated? He'd better send a memorandum. Returning to his apartment, he took one of the little message shuttles given him, laid a report in it, and set the control studs for the London office, June 25th, 1894. When he pushed the final button, the box vanished with a small whoosh of air rushing in where it had been. It returned in a few minutes. He scanned the sheet of foolscap with the swiftness he had learned. Dear Sir, in reply to yours of September 6th, 1954, beg to acknowledge receipt and would commend your diligence. The affair has only just begun at this end, and we are much occupied at present with preventing assassination of Her Majesty, as well as with the Balkan question. Would therefore much appreciate it if you and some qualified British agent would come to our assistance. Unless we hear otherwise, we shall expect you on June 26th, 1894, at 12 midnight. Your humble and obedient servant, J. Mainweathering. Everhard called up Gordon, got an OK, and arranged to pick up a time hopper at the company's warehouse. Then he shot a note to Charlie Whitcomb in 1947 and went off to get his machine. It was reminiscent of a motorcycle without wheels or handlebars. There were two saddles and an anti-gravity propulsion unit. Everhard set the dials for Whitcomb's era, touched the main button, and found himself in another warehouse in London, 1947. He sat for a moment, 
reflecting that at this instant, he himself, seven years younger, was attending college back in the States. Then Whitcomb shouldered past the watchman and took his hand. Good to see you again, old chap, he said. His haggard face lit up in the curiously charming smile which Everhart had come to know. And so, Victoria, eh? Reckon so. Jump on. Everhard reset. This time he would emerge in an office, a very private inner office. It blinked into existence around him. There was an unexpectedly heavy effect to the oak furniture, the thick carpet, the flaring gas mantles. Mainweathering himself got out of a chair and came to greet them. Good evening, gentlemen. Pleasant journey, I trust. Oh, yes, sorry. You gentlemen are new to the business, eh, what? Always a bit disconcerting at first. I remember how shocked I was on a visit to the 21st century. You must uh, excuse my lack of hospitality, but we really are frightfully busy. Fanatic German up in 1917 learned the time travel secret from an unwary anthropologist. Stole a machine, has come to London to assassinate Her Majesty. We're having the devil's own time finding him. It seems, began Everard, that there's the strong probability that there's been hanky-panky going on back in ancient British times. Saxon, you mean, corrected Whitcomb, who had checked out the data himself. Good many people confuse British and Saxons. <laughs> Almost as many as confuse Saxons and Jutes, said Mainweathering blandly. Kent was invaded from Jutland, I understand. Uh, <clears throat> clothes here, gentlemen, and funds and papers all prepared for you. I sometimes think you field agents don't appreciate how much work we have to do in the offices for even the smallest operation. <laughs> Pardon. <clears throat> have you a plan of campaign? Yes. Everard began stripping off his 20th century garments. I think so. We both know enough about the Victorian era to get by. I'll have to remain American, though. Yes, I see you put that in my papers. Everhard struggled with the awkward suit. It fitted him well enough. His measurements were on file in this office. But he hadn't appreciated the relative comfort of his own fashions before. Mainweathering consulted his Bradshaw. You can get the 823 out of Charing Cross tomorrow morning, he said. Allow half an hour to get from here to the station. Okay. Everhard and Whitcomb remounted their hopper and vanished. This was the first moment that the reality of time travel struck home to Everard. He had known it with the top of his mind, been duly impressed, but it was for his emotions merely exotic. Now, clopping through a London he did not know in a hansom cab, not a tourist trap anachronism, but a working machine, dusty and battered, smelling an air which held more smoke than a 20th century city, but no gasoline fumes. Seeing the crowds which milled past, gentlemen in bowlers and top hats, sooty navvies, long-skirted women, and not actors, but real, talking, perspiring, laughing, and somber human beings, off on real business. It hit him with full force that he was here. At this moment, his mother had not been born. Grover Cleveland was president of the United States, and Victoria was queen of England. It was like a blow on the head. The train let them off at a sleepy village station among carefully tended flower gardens, where they engaged a buggy to drive them to the Wyndham estate. A polite constable admitted them after a few questions. They were passing themselves off as archaeologists, Everard from America and Whitcomb from Australia, who had been quite anxious to meet Lord Wyndham and were shocked by his tragic end. Mainweathering, who seemed to have tentacles everywhere, had supplied them with letters of introduction from a well-known authority at the British Museum. The inspector from Scotland Yard agreed to let them look at the barrow. It was a long and high mound, covered with grass, save where a raw scar showed excavation to the funeral chamber. This had been lined with rough-hewn timbers, but had long ago collapsed. Fragments of what had been wood still lay on the dirt. The newspapers mentioned something about a metal casket, said Everard. I wonder if we might have a look at it, too. The inspector nodded agreeably and led them off to an outbuilding where the major finds were laid forth on a table. Hmm, said Whitcomb. His gaze was thoughtful on the sleek, bare face of the small chest. It shimmered bluely. 
some time-proof alloy yet to be discovered. Everard approached it warily. He had a pretty good idea of what was inside. Pulling a counter out of his bag, he aimed it at the box. Its needle wavered. Not much, but... Carefully, he threw back the lid and held the counter above the box. God, there was enough radioactivity inside to kill a man in a day. He had just a glimpse of the heavy, dull, shining ingots before he slammed the lid down again. Be careful with that stuff, he said shakily. Praise heaven, whoever carried that devil's load had come for an age when they knew how to block off radiation. He and Whitcomb made an excuse to leave as soon as possible. On the way back to London, when they were safely alone in their compartment, the Englishman took out a moldering fragment of wood. Slip this into my pocket at the barrow, he said. It'll help us date the thing. Hand me that radiocarbon counter, will you? He popped the wood into the device, turned some knobs, and read off the answer. 1,430 years, plus or minus about 10. Um, 464 AD. The jutes were just getting established in Kent. Turning in their report to Maine Weathering, they spent a day sightseeing, while he sent messages across time and activated the great machine of the patrol. Maine Weathering had arrangements made when they returned to his office. Puffing a cigar, he strode up and down, pudgy hands clasped behind his tailcoat, and rattled off the story. Metal being identified with high probability. Isotopic fuel from around the 30th century. Checkup reveals that a merchant from the Ing Empire was visiting year 2987 to barter his raw materials for their synthrope, secret of which had been lost in the interregnum. Naturally, he took precautions, tried to pass himself off as a trader from the Saturnian system, but nevertheless disappeared. So did his time shuttle. Presumably someone in 2987 found out what he was and murdered him for his machine. Patrol notified, but no trace of machine. Finally recovered from 5th century England by two patrolmen named Ho 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 Everard and Whitcomb. Well, if we've already succeeded, why bother, grinned the American. Maine Weathering looked shocked. But my dear fellow, you have not already succeeded. The job is yet to do, in terms of your and my duration sense. And please do not take success for granted, merely because history recalls it. Time is not rigid. Man has free will. If you fail, history will change and will not ever have recorded your success. I will not have told you about it. All right, all right, I was only joking, said Everard. Let's get going. It turned out that even the patrol knew little about the dark period when the Romans had left Britain. The Romano-British civilization was crumbling, and the British were moving in. It had never seemed an important one. The office at London, 1000 AD, sent up what material it had, together with suits of clothes that would get by. Everhard and Whitcomb spent an hour unconscious under the hypnotic educators, to emerge with fluency in Latin and in several Saxon and Jewish dialects, and with a fair knowledge of the mores. The clothes were awkward, trousers, shirts and coats of rough wool, leather cloaks, an interminable collection of thongs and laces. Long flaxen wigs covered modern haircuts. A clean shave would pass unnoticed, even in the fifth century. Whitcomb carried an axe, Everhard a sword, both made to measure of high carbon steel, but put more reliance on the little 26th century sonic guns stuck under their coats. Excellent! Maine Weathering pulled a watch out of his pocket and consulted it. I shall expect you back here at, shall we say, four o'clock? I will have some armed guards on hand in case you have a prisoner along, and we can go out to tea afterward. He shook their hands. Good hunting. Everhard swung under the time hopper, set the controls for 464 A.D. at the Adelton Barrow, a summer midnight, and threw the switch. <laughs> There was a full moon. Under it, the land lay big and lonely, with a darkness of forest blocking out the horizon. Somewhere a wolf howled. The mound was there yet. They had come late. Rising on the anti-gravity unit, they peered across a dense, shadowy wood. A thorpe lay about a mile from the barrow, 
one hall of hewn timber, and a cluster of smaller buildings around a courtyard. Cultivated fields, observed Whitcomb. His voice was hushed in the stillness. The Jutes and Saxons were mostly yeomen, you know, who came here looking for land. Imagine the Britons were pretty well cleared out of this area some years ago. We've got to find out about that burial, said Everhard. Should we go back and locate the moment when the grave was made? No, it might be safer to inquire now at a later date, when whatever excitement there was had died down. Say, tomorrow morning. Whitcomb nodded, and Everhard brought the hopper down into the concealment of a thicket and jumped up five hours. The sun was blinding in the northeast. Dew glistened on the long grass, and the birds were making an unholy racket. Dismounting, the agent sent the hopper shooting up at a fantastic velocity to hover 10 miles above ground and come to them when called on a midget radio. They approached the Thorpe openly. Entering the courtyard, they found it unpaved but richly carpeted with mud and manure. A couple of naked, two-headed children gaped at them from a hut of earth and wattles. A girl who was sitting outside milking a scrubby little cow let out a small shriek. A gray-bearded man with an axe in his hand appeared in the hall entrance. Like everyone else of this period, he was several inches shorter than the 20th century average. He studied them warily before wishing them good morning. Everard smiled politely. I hight Ufa Hundigson, and my brother is Newby, he said. We are merchants from Jutland, come hither to trade at Canterbury. I hight Wolfnorth, son of Alfred, said the yeoman. Enter and break your fast with us. The hall was big and dim and smoky, full of a chattering crowd. Wolfnoth's children, their spouses and children, dependent carls and their wives and children and grandchildren. It was not hard to get a conversation going. These people were as gossipy as isolated yokels anywhere. The trouble was with inventing plausible accounts of what was going on in Jutland. Once or twice Wolfnoth, who was no fool, caught them in some mistake. But Everhard said firmly, you have heard of falsehood. News takes strange forms when it crosses the sea. He was surprised to learn how much contact there still was with the old countries. But the talk of weather and crops was not very different from the kind he knew in the 20th century Middle West. Only later was he able to slip in a question about the barrow. Wolfnoth frowned, and his plump, toothless wife hastily made a protective sign toward a rude wooden idol. It is not good to speak of such things, muttered the Jute. I would the wizard had not been buried on my land, but he was close to my father who died last year and would hear of naught else. Wizard? Whitcomb pricked up his ears. What tale is this? Well, you may as well know, grumbled Wolfnoth. He was a stranger, Height Stain, who appeared in Canterbury some six years ago. He must have been from far away for he spoke not the English or British tongues, but King Hengist guessed at him, and Eftstoons he learned. He gave the king strange but goodly gifts, and was crafty. There are those who thought he was Woden, but that cannot be since he died. He was slain by unknowns three years ago, and buried here with sacrifices and such of his possessions as his foes had not reaved. Three years, eh? breathed Whitcomb. I see. It took a good hour to break away. Everhard and Whitcomb returned to the thicket, called down the hopper and mounted it, and jumped three years back in time. Now comes the rough part, Everhard said, peering out of the thicket at the knighted thorpe. The mound was not there now. The wizard stain was still alive. If we fail, Wolfnoth will be telling us a different story three years from now. Probably that stain is there. He may kill us twice. And England, pulled out of the Dark Ages into a neoclassical culture, won't evolve into anything you'd recognize by 1894. I wonder what Stain's game is. He lifted the hopper and sent it through the sky toward Canterbury. The city brawled and bustled around them, though again it was the ripe smell which impressed Everhard most. Among the jostling jutes, he spotted an occasional Romano-Briton, disdainfully picking away through the muck and pulling his shabby tunic clear of contact with these savages. It would have been funny if it weren't pathetic. There was an extraordinarily dirty inn filling the moss-grown ruins of what had been a rich man's townhouse. Everhart and Whitcomb found that their money was of high value here where trade was principally in kind. By standing a few rounds of drinks, they got all the information they wanted. 
King Hengist Hall was near the middle of town. Oh, yes, Stane. He lived in the house right next to it. Strange fellow. Some said he was a god. He certainly had an eye for the girls. Yes, they said. He was behind all this peace talk with the Britons. More and more of those slickers coming in every day. It's getting so an honest man can't let a little blood without... Of course, Stane is very wise. I wouldn't say anything against him. Understand, after all, he can throw lightning. The house had been carefully renovated, its white porticoed facade almost painfully clean against the grubbiness around it. Two guards lounged on the stairs, snapping to alertness as the agents approached. Everard fed them money and a story about being a visitor who had news that would surely interest the great wizard. Tell him, man from tomorrow. Tis a password, got it? The guard returned and led them to a good-sized room where a man stood waiting before a rude wooden couch. As they entered, he raised his hand, and Everhard saw the slim barrel of a 30th century blast ray. Keep your hands in sight and well away from your sides, said the man gently. Otherwise, I shall belike have to smite you with a thunderbolt. Whitcomb sucked in a sharp, dismayed breath. But Everhard had been rather expecting this. Even so, there was a cold knot in his stomach. The wizard Stain was a small man, dressed in a fine embroidered tunic, which must have come from some British villa. His body was lithe, his head large, with a face of rather engaging ugliness, under a shock of black hair. A grin of tension bent his lips. Search them, Edgar, he ordered. Take out aught they may bear in their clothing. The jute's frisking was clumsy, but he found the stunners and tossed them to the floor. Thou mayst go said Stain. Edgar shambled out. At least we still have a sword and axe, thought Everard. But they're not much use with that thing looking at us. So, you come from tomorrow, murmured Stain. A sudden film of sweat glistened on his forehead. I wondered about that. Speak you the later English tongue? Everard's mind raced. Under the brassiness of desperation, he knew that death waited for his first mistake. In our day, we talk thus. And he reeled off a paragraph of Mexican Spanish chatter, garbling it as much as he dared. So, a Latin tongue, Stain's eyes glittered. The blaster shook in his hand. When be you from? The 20th century after Christ, and our land height, Leoness. It lies across the Western Ocean. America. It was a gasp. Was it ever called America? No. I wot not what you speak of. Stain shuddered uncontrollably, mastering himself. Know you the Roman tongue? Everhard nodded. Stain laughed nervously. Then let us speak that, if you knew how sick I am of this local hog language. His Latin was a little broken. Obviously, he had picked it up in this century, but fluent enough. He waved the blaster. Pardon my discourtesy, but I have to be careful. Properly speaking, I am Roger Stein, from the year 2987. Have you heard of me? Who else, said Everard. We came back looking for this mysterious Stain, who seemed to be one of the crucial figures of history. We suspected he might have been a time traveler, peregrinator temporis, that is. Now we know. Three years. Stein began pacing feverishly, the blaster swinging in his hand but he was too far off for a sudden leap. Three years I have been here. If you knew how often I have lain awake, wondering if I would succeed. Tell me, is your world united? The world and the planet, said Everard. They have been for a long time. Inwardly, he shivered. His life hung on his ability to guess what Stain's plans were. And are you a free people? We are. That is to say, the emperor presides, but the senate makes the laws, and it is elected by the people. There was an almost holy look on the gnomish face, transfiguring it. As I dreamed, whispered Stein. Thank you. So you came back from your period to create history? No, said Stein. To change it. Words tumbled out of him as if he had wished to speak and dared not for many years. I was a historian, too. 
By chance, I met a man who claimed to be a merchant from the Saturnian moons. But since I had lived there once, I saw through the fraud. Investigating, I learned the truth. He was a time traveler from the very far future. You must understand that the age I lived in was a terrible one. And as a psychographic historian, I realized that the war, poverty, and tyranny which cursed us were not due to any innate evil in man, but to simple cause and effect. Machine technology had risen in a world divided against itself, and war grew to be an ever larger and more destructive enterprise. There had been periods of peace, even fairly long ones, but the disease was too deep-rooted. Conflict was a part of our very civilization. My family had been wiped out in a Venusian raid. I had nothing to lose. I took the time machine after disposing of its owner. The great mistake, I thought, had been made back in the Dark Ages. Rome had united a vast empire in peace, and out of peace, justice can always arise. But Rome exhausted herself in the effort and was now falling apart. The barbarians coming in were vigorous. They could do much, but they were quickly corrupted. But here is England. It has been isolated from the rotting fabric of Roman society. The Germanics are entering, filthy oafs, but strong and willing to learn. In my history, they simply wiped out British civilization, and then, being intellectually helpless, were swallowed up by the new and evil civilization called Western. I want to see something better happen. Christianity is inevitable, of course, but I will see to it that it is the right kind of Christianity, one which will educate and civilize men without shackling their minds. Eventually, England will be in a position to start taking over the continent. Finally, one world. Tears were on his cheeks. Everhard moved closer. Stein pointed the blast ray at his belly, not yet quite trusting him. Everhard circled casually, and Stein swiveled to keep him covered. But the man was too agitated by the seeming proof of his own success to remember Whitcomb. Everhard threw a look over his shoulder at the Englishman. Whitcomb hurled his axe. Everhard dove for the floor. Whitcomb sprang, getting a grip on his gun hand. Stain howled, struggling to force the blaster around. Everhard jumped up to help. There was a moment of confusion. Then the blaster went off again, and Stain was suddenly a dead weight in their arms. Blood drenched their coats from the hideous opening in his chest. Crouching a moment, Everhard listened. A feminine scream sounded from the inner chambers, but no one was entering at the door. Well, I guess we carried it off, he panted. Yes. Whitcomb looked dully at the corpse sprawled before him. It seemed pathetically small. I didn't mean for him to die, said Everhard, but time is tough. It was written, I suppose. Better this way than a patrol caught on the exile planet, said Whitcomb. Technically, at least, he was a thief and a murderer, said Everhard, but it was a great dream he had. And we upset it. History might have upset it, probably would have. One man just isn't powerful enough or wise enough. I think most human misery is due to well-meaning fanatics like him. So we just fold our hands and take what comes. Let's get going, said Everard. He had to blast the lock off an inner door. The room beyond held an Ing model time shuttle, a few boxes with weapons and supplies, some books. Everhard loaded it all into the machine except the fuel chest. That had to be left, so that up in the future he would learn of this and come back to stop the man who would be God. Suppose you take this to the warehouse in 1894, he said. I'll ride our hopper back and meet you at the office. Whitcomb gave him a long stare. The man's face was drawn. Even as Everhard watched him, it stiffened with resolution. All right, old chap, said the Englishman. He smiled almost wistfully and clasped Everhard's hand. So long. Good luck. Everhard stared after him as he entered the great steel cylinder. That was an odd thing to say when they'd be having tea up in 1894 in a couple of hours. Worry nagged him as he went out of the building and mingled with the crowd. Charlie was a peculiar cuss. Well, he called the time hopper back down, took a last look at old England, and jumped up to 1894.
Main Weathering and his guards were there as promised. It took a while for Everhard to wash up, change clothes, and deliver a full account to the secretary. By then, Whitcomb should have arrived in a hansom, but there was no sign of him. Main Weathering called the warehouse on the radio and turned back with a frown. He hasn't come yet, he said. Everhard gnawed his lip. I don't know what the matter is. Maybe he misunderstood and went up to 1947 instead. An exchange of notes revealed that Whitcomb had not reported in at that end either. I had best inform the field agency, said Main Weathering. Hey, what? They should be able to find him. No. Wait. Everhard began shucking his Victorian suit. His hands trembled. Get my 20th century clothes, will you? I may be able to find him by myself. The patrol will want a preliminary report of your idea and intentions, reminded Main Weathering. To hell with the patrol, said Everhard. London, 1944. The early winter night had fallen, and a thin, cold wind blew down streets which were gulfs of darkness. Everhard left his hopper on the sidewalk. Nobody was out when the V-bombs were falling, and groped slowly through the murk. November 17th. His trained memory had called up the date for him. Mary Nelson had died this day. He found a public phone booth on the corner and looked in the directory. There were a lot of Nelsons, but only one Mary listed for the Streetham area. Fire and thunder roared at him as he came out. He flung himself on his belly while glass whistled where he had been. The new blaze was a dance behind him as he ran for his machine. He jumped aboard and took off into the air. High above London, he saw only a vast darkness spotted with flame. Walpurgisnacht, and all hell let loose on earth. Hurrying toward the place, he saw a house tumbled and smashed and flaming. It was only three blocks from the Nelson home. He was too late. No. He checked the time, just 10.30, and jumped back two hours. It was still night, but the slain house stood solid in the gloom. For a second, he wanted to warn those inside. But no. All over the world, people were dying. He was not stained to take history on his shoulders. He grinned wryly, dismounted, and walked through the gate. He was not a damn Donnellian either. He knocked on the door and it opened. A middle-aged woman looked at him through the murk, and he realized it was odd to see an American in civilian clothes here. Um, excuse me, he said. Do you know Miss Mary Nelson? Why, yes. Hesitation. She lives nearby. She's coming over soon. Are you a friend? Everhard nodded. She sent me here with a, a message for you, Mrs. Uh, Enderby. Oh, yes, Mrs. Enderby. I I'm terribly forgetful. Look, Miss Nelson wanted me to say she's very sorry, but she can't come. However, she wants you and your entire family over at 10.30. All of us, sir? But the children, th by all means, th the children too, every one of you. She has a very special surprise arranged, uh, something she can only show you then. All of you have to be there. Well, all right, sir, if she says so. All of you at 10.30 without fail. I'll see you then, Mrs. Enderby. Everhard nodded and walked back to the street. He had done what he could. Next was the Nelson house. He rode his hopper three blocks down, parked it in the gloom of an alley, and walked up to the house. He was guilty too now, as guilty as Stein. He wondered what the exile planet was like. There was no sign of the Ing shuttle, and it was too big to conceal. So Charlie hadn't arrived yet. He'd have to play it by ear till then. A young woman opened the door for him. She was a pretty little girl, not spectacular, but nice-looking in her trim uniform. Uh, Miss Nelson? Yes? My name is Everhard. I'm a friend of Charlie Whitcomb. Uh, may I come in? I have a rather surprising bit of news for you. I was about to go out, she said apologetically. No, you weren't. Wrong line. She was stiffening with indignation. I'm sorry. Please, uh, may I explain? She led him into a drab and cluttered parlor. Won't you sit down, Mr. Everhard? Everhard made himself comfortable. Mary perched on the edge of a sofa, watching him with large eyes. Are you in the Air Force? she asked. Is that how you met Charlie? 
No, I'm an intelligence, which is the reason for this mufti. Uh, may I ask when you last saw him? Oh, weeks ago. He's stationed in France just now. I hope this war will soon be over. She cocked her head curiously. But what is this news you have? I'll come to it in a moment. He began to ramble as much as he dared, talking of conditions across the channel. It was strange to sit conversing with a ghost, and his conditioning prevented him from telling her the truth. He wanted to, but when he tried, his tongue froze up on him. And what it cost to get a bottle of red ink ordinaire. Please, she interrupted impatiently, would you mind coming to the point? I do have an engagement for tonight. Oh, uh, sorry, very sorry, I'm sure. You see, it's, it's this way. A knock at the door saved him. Excuse me, she murmured, and went out past the blackout drapes to open it. Everhard padded after her. She stepped back with a small shriek. Charlie! Whitcomb pressed her to him, heedless of the blood still wet on his Judish clothes. Everhard came into the hall. The Englishman stared with a kind of horror. You... He snatched for his stunner, but Everhard's was already out. Don't be a fool, said the American. I'm your friend. I want to help you. What crazy scheme did you have anyway? I keep her here, keep her from going to her... And do you think they haven't got a means of spotting you? Everhard slipped into temporal, the only possible language in Mary's frightened presence. When I left Maine weathering, he was getting damn suspicious. Unless we do this right, every unit of the patrol is going to be alerted. The error will be rectified, probably by killing her. You'll go to exile. I... Whitcomb gulped. His face was a mask of fear. You would let her go ahead and die? No, but this has to be done more carefully. We'll escape. Find some period away from everything. Go back to the dinosaur age if we must. Look, fellow, there isn't going to be any place or any time you can hide in. Mary Nelson died tonight. That's history. She wasn't around in 1947. That's history. I've already got myself in Dutch. The family she was going to visit will be out of their home when the bomb hits it. If you try to run away with her, you'll be found. It's pure luck that a patrol unit hasn't already arrived. Whitcomb fought for steadiness. Suppose I, I jump to 1948 with her. How do you know that she hasn't suddenly reappeared in 1948? Maybe, maybe that's history too. Man, you can't. Try it, go on. Tell her you're gonna hop her four years into the future. Whitcomb groaned. A giveaway. And I'm conditioned. Yeah, you have barely enough latitude to appear this way before her. But talking to her, you'll have to lie out of it because you can't help yourself. Anyway, how would you explain her? If she stays Mary Nelson, she's a deserter from the WAAF. If she takes another name, where's her birth certificate, her school record, her ration book, any of those bits of paper these 20th century governments worship so devoutly? It's hopeless, son. Then what can we do? Face the patrol and slug it out. Wait here a minute. There was a cold calm over Everhard. No time to be afraid or to wonder at his own behavior. It didn't take long. A hopper appeared with two men in patrol gray aboard. There were weapons in their hands. Everhard cut them down with a low-powered stun beam. Help me tie him up, Charlie, he said. Mary huddled voiceless in a corner. When the men awoke, Everhard stood over them with a bleak smile. What are we charged with, boys, he asked in temporal. I think you know, said one of the prisoners calmly. The main office had us trace you. Checking up next week, we found out that you had evacuated a family scheduled to be bombed. Whitcomb's record suggested you would then come here to help him save this woman who was supposed to die tonight. You better let us go, or it'll be the worst for you. I have not changed history, said Everhard. The Donnellians are still up there, aren't they? Well, yes, of course, but... How did you know the Enderby family was supposed to die? Their house was struck, and they said they only had left it because... Ah, but the point is, they did leave it. That's written. Now it's you who wants to change the past. But this woman here... Are you sure there wasn't a Mary Nelson who, let us say, settled in London in 1850 and died of old age about 1900? The lean face grinned. You're trying hard, aren't you? It won't work. You can't fight the entire patrol. Can I, though? I can leave you here to be found by the Enderbys. What's that going to do to history? 
The patrol will take corrective measures, as you did back in the fifth century. Perhaps. I can make it a lot easier for them, though, if they'll hear my appeal. I want a Donellian. What? You heard me, said Everhard. If necessary, I'll mount the hopper and ride a million years up. I'll point out to them personally how much simpler it'll be if they'll give us a break. That will not be necessary. Everhard spun around with a gasp. The stunner fell from his hand. He could not look at the shape which blazed before his eyes. There was a dry sobbing in his throat as he backed away. Your appeal has been considered. It was known and weighed ages before you were born. But you were still a necessary link in the chain of time. If you had failed tonight, there would not be mercy. To us, it was a matter of record that one Charles and Mary Wickham lived in Victoria's England. It was also a matter of record that Mary Nelson died with the family she was visiting in 1944, and that Charles Wickham had lived a bachelor and finally been killed on active duty with the patrol. The discrepancy was noted, and as even the smallest paradox is a dangerous weakness in the space-time fabric, it had to be rectified by eliminating one or the other fact from ever having existed. You have decided which it will be. Everard knew somewhere in his shaking brain that the patrolmen were suddenly free. He knew that his hopper had been, was being, would be snatched invisibly away. He knew that history now read WAAF Mary Nelson missing, presumed killed by bomb near the home of the Enderby family, who had all been at her house when their own was destroyed. Charles Whitcomb disappearing in 1947, presumed accidentally drowned. He knew that Mary was given the truth, conditioned against ever revealing it, and sent back with Charlie to 1850. He knew they would make their middle-class way through life, never feeling quite at home in Victoria's reign, that Charlie would often have wistful thoughts of what he had been in the patrol, and then turn to his wife and children and decide it had not been such a great sacrifice after all. That much he knew, and then the Donellian was gone. As the whirling darkness in his head subsided, and he looked with clearing eyes at the two patrolmen, he did not know what his own destiny was. Come on, said the first man. Let's get out of here before somebody wakes up. We'll give you a lift back to your year, 1954, isn't it? And then what? asked Everard. The patrolman shrugged. Under his casual manner lay the shock which had seized him in the Donellian's presence. Report to your sector, Chief. You've shown yourself obviously unfit for steady work. So, just cashiered, huh? You needn't be so dramatic. Did you think this case was the only one of its kind in a million years of patrol work? There's a regular procedure for it. You'll want more training, of course. Your type of personality goes best with unattached status. Any age, any place, wherever and whenever you may be needed. I think you'll like it. Everard climbed weakly aboard the hopper. And when he got off again, a decade had passed. In the only game in town, we rejoin Mance Everard with Time Patrol Cadet John Sandoval as they are dispatched on a mission to the American Southwest in the days before the Spanish Conquistadors. John Sandoval did not belong to his name. Nor did it seem right that he should stand in slacks and aloha shirt before an apartment window opening on mid-20th century Manhattan. Everard was used to anachronism, but the dark, hooked face confronting him always seemed to want war paint, a horse, and a gun sighted on some pale thief. Okay, Everhard said, the Chinese discovered America. It's interesting, but why does the fact need my services? I wish to hell I knew, Sandoval answered. His rangy form turned until he was staring outward. Towers were sharp against a clear sky. 
the noise of traffic was muted by height. His hands clasped and unclasped behind his back. I was ordered to co-opt an unattached agent. Go back with him and take whatever measures seemed indicated, he went on after a while. I knew you best, so... His voice trailed off. But shouldn't you get an Indian like yourself, asked Everard. I'd seem rather out of place in 13th century America. So much the better. Make it impressive, mysterious. It won't be too tough a job, really. Of course not, said Everard, whatever the job actually is. He took pipe and tobacco pouch from his disreputable smoking jacket and stuffed the bowl in quick, nervous jabs. I get the impression, said Everard slowly, that this is not a simple rectification of extratemporal interference. Right, said Sandoval in a harsh voice. When I reported what I'd found, the Yuan Milieu office made a thorough investigation. No time travelers are involved. Kublai Khan thought this up entirely by himself. He may have been inspired by Marco Polo's accounts of Venetian and Arab sea voyages, but it was legitimate history, even if Marco's book doesn't mention anything of the sort. The Chinese had quite a nautical tradition of their own, said Everard. Oh, it's all very natural. So how do we come in? He got his pipe lit and drew hard on it. Sandoval still hadn't spoken, so he asked, How did you happen to find this expedition? It wasn't in Navajo country, was it? Hell, I'm not confined to studying my own tribe, Sandoval answered. I've been working on Athabascan migrations generally. He was an ethnic specialist, tracing the history of peoples who never wrote their own so that the patrol could know exactly what the events were that had safeguarded. I was working along the eastern slope of the Cascades, near Crater Lake, he went on. That's Luduami country, but I had reason to believe an Athabascan tribe I'd lost track of had passed that way. The natives spoke of mysterious strangers coming from the north. I went to have a look, and there the expedition was, Mongols with horses. I checked their back trail and found their camp at the mouth of the Chehalis River, where a few more Mongols were helping the Chinese sailors guard the ships. I hopped back upstairs like a bat out of Los Angeles and reported. Everhard sat down and stared at the other man. How thorough an investigation did get made at the Chinese end, he said. Are you absolutely certain there was no extra-temporal interference? It could be one of those unplanned blunders, you know, whose consequences aren't obvious for decades. I thought of that, too, when I got my assignment, Sandoval nodded. I even went directly to Yuan Milieu HQ in Kambaluk, or Peking to you. They told me they had checked it clear back to Genghis's lifetime, and spatially as far as Indonesia, and it was all perfectly okay, like the Norse in their Vinland. It simply didn't happen to have gotten the same publicity. As far as the Chinese court knew, an expedition had been sent out and had never returned, and Kublai decided it wasn't worthwhile to send another. The record of it lay in the Imperial Archives but was destroyed during the Ming Revolt, which expelled the Mongols. Historiography forgot the incident. Still, Everard brooded. Normally, he liked his work, but there was something abnormal about this occasion. Obviously, he said, the expedition met a disaster. We'd like to know what. But why do you need an unattached agent to spy on them? Sandoval turned from the window. It crossed Everard's mind again, fleetingly, how little the Navajo belonged here. Somehow, he never quite fitted the 20th century. Well, do any of us? Could any man with real roots stand knowing what will eventually happen to his own people? But I'm not supposed to spy, Sandoval exclaimed. When I'd reported, my orders came straight back from Denelian headquarters. No explanation, no excuses. The naked command to arrange that disaster, to revise history myself. Anno Domini, 1280. The writ of Kublai Khan ran over degrees of latitude and longitude. He dreamed of world empire, and his court honored any guest who brought fresh knowledge or new philosophy. A young Venetian merchant named Marco Polo had become a particular favorite. But not all peoples desired a Mongol overlord. Revolutionary secret societies germinated throughout those several conquered realms lumped together as Cathay. 
Japan, with the Hojo family and able power behind the throne, had already repelled one invasion. Nor were the Mongols unified, save in theory. The Russian princes had become tax collectors for the Golden Horde. The Il Khan Abaka sat in Baghdad. Elsewhere, a shadowy Abbasid caliphate had refuge in Cairo. Nicholas III was pope. Philip the Bold was king of France. And in North America, Mance Everard and John Sandoval reined their horses to stare down a long hill. The date I first saw them is last week, said the Navajo. They've come quite a ways since. At this rate, they'll be in Mexico in a couple of months. By Mongol standards, Everhard told him, they're proceeding leisurely. He raised his binoculars. Around him, the land burned green with April. Even the highest and oldest beaches fluttered gay young leaves. Pines roared in the wind, which blew down off the mountains cold and swift and smelling of melted snow. The peaks of the Cascade Range seemed to float in the west, blue-white, distant, and holy. Eastward, the foothills tumbled in clumps of forest and meadow to a valley. And so at last, beyond the horizon, to prairies thunderous under buffalo herds. Everard focused on the expedition. It wound through the open areas, more or less following a small river. Some 70 men rode shaggy, dun-colored, short-legged Asian horses. What do you know about this bunch? No more than I've told you, which is little more than you've now seen, and that record which lay for a while in Kublai's archives. But you recall, it barely notes that four ships under the command of the Noyon Toktai and the scholar Li Tai Chung were dispatched to explore the islands beyond Japan. Everard nodded absently. No sense in sitting here and rehashing what they'd already gone over a hundred times. It was only a way of postponing action. He dipped in his saddlebag, took out a half-gallon canteen, and hoisted it. The scotch was pungent at Everard's throat, heartening in his veins. He clucked to his horse, and both patrolmen rode down the slope. A whistling cut the air. They had been seen. He maintained a steady pace toward the head of the Mongol line. A pair of outriders closed in on either flank. Arrows knocked to their short, powerful bows, but did not interfere. I suppose we look harmless, Everard thought. Like Sandoval, he wore 20th century outdoor clothes. Hunting jacket to break the wind, hat to keep off the rain. They both bore daggers for show. Mauser machine pistols and 30th century stun beam projectors for business. The troop reined in. So disciplined that it was almost like one man halting. Everard scanned them closely as he neared. He'd gotten a pretty complete electronic education in an hour or so before departure. Language, history, technology, manners, morals, of Mongols and Chinese, and even the local Indians. But he had never before seen these people close up. They weren't spectacular. Stocky, bow-legged, with thin beards and flat, broad faces that shone greased in the sunlight. They were all well-equipped, wearing boots and trousers, laminated leather cuirasses with lacquer ornamentation, and conical steel helmets that might have a spike or a plume on top. Their weapons were curved sword, knife, lance, compound bow. They watched the patrolmen approach, their narrow, dark eyes impassive. The chief was readily identified. He rode in the van, and a tattered silken cloak blew from his shoulders. He was rather larger and even more hard-faced than his average trooper, with a reddish beard and almost Roman nose. Tok Tai Noyan held his place, measuring Everard with a steady carnivore look. Greeting, he called when the newcomers were in earshot. What spirit brings you? He spoke the Lutuami dialect, which was later to become the Klamath language with an atrocious accent. Everard replied in flawless barking Mongolian. Greeting to you, Toktai, son of Batu. The Tengri willing, we come in peace. It was an effective touch. Everard glimpsed Mongols reaching for lucky charms or making signs against the evil eye. But the man mounted at Toktai's left was quick to recover a schooled self-possession. Ah, he said. So men of the western lands have also reached this country. We did not know that. Everard looked at him. He was taller than any Mongol, his skin almost white, his features and hands delicate. Though dressed much like the others, he was unarmed. He seemed older than the Noyan, perhaps fifty. 
Everard bowed in the saddle and switched to North Chinese. Honored Li Tai Chung, it grieves this insignificant person to contradict your eminence, but we belong to the great realm further south. We have heard rumors, said the scholar. He couldn't quite suppress excitement. Even this far north, tales have been born of a rich and splendid country. We are seeking it that we may bring your Khan the greetings of the Ka Khan, Kublai, son of Chulis, son of Genghis. The earth lies at his feet. We know of the Ka Khan, said Everard. Little is known in return of us, for our master does not seek the outside world, nor encourage it to seek him. Permit me to introduce my unworthy self. I am called Everard, and am not a Russian or a Westerner. I belong to the Border Guardians. Let them figure out what that meant. You didn't come with much company, snapped Taktai. More was not required, said Everhard in his smoothest voice. And you are far from home, put in Lee. No farther than you would be, honorable sirs, in the Kyrgyz marches. Taktai clapped a hand to his sword hilt. His eyes were chill and weary. Come he said. Be as welcome as ambassadors, then. Let's make camp and hear the word of your king. The sun, low above the western peaks, turned their snowcaps tarnished silver. The Mongols were obviously taken aback at their visitors and this early halt. They kept wooden faces, but their eyes would stray to Everard and Sandoval, and they would mutter formulas of their various religions, chiefly pagan, but some Buddhist, Muslim, or Nestorian prayers. It did not impair the efficiency with which they set up camp, posted guard, cared for the animals, prepared to cook supper. But Everard judged they were more quiet than usual. The patterns impressed on his brain by the educator called Mongols talkative and cheerful as a rule, he sat cross-legged on a tent floor. Sandoval, Taktai, and Lee completed the circle. Rugs lay under them, and a brazier kept a pot of tea hot. Taktai poured cumis with his own hands and offered it to Everard, who slurped as loudly as etiquette demanded and passed it on. He had drunk worse things than fermented mare's milk, but was glad that everyone switched to tea after the ritual. The Mongol chief spoke. Now let our guests declare the business of their king. First, would you name him for us? His name may not be spoken, said Everard. Of his realm you have heard only the palest rumors. You may judge his power, Noyan, by the fact that he needed only us two to come this far, and that we needed only one mount apiece. Toktai grunted. Those are handsome animals you ride, though I wonder how well they would do on the steps. Did it take you long to get here? No more than a day, Noyan. We have means. Everard reached in his jacket and brought out a couple of small gift-wrapped parcels. Our lord bade us present the Cathayan leaders with these tokens of regard. While the paper was being removed, Sandoval leaned over and hissed in English, Dig their expressions, Mance. Toktai gave them a hard stare, but returned to his present, a flashlight, which had to be demonstrated and exclaimed over. He was a little afraid of it at first, even mumbled a charm. Then he remembered that a Mongol wasn't allowed to be afraid of anything except thunder, mastered himself, and soon was as delighted as a child. Since you know so much, Taktai began, you must also know that our invasion of Japan failed several years ago. The will of heaven was otherwise, said Lee with courtier blandness. Horse apples, growled Taktai. The stupidity of men was otherwise, you mean. We were too few, too ignorant, and we'd come too far and seas too rough. And what of it? We'll return there one day. Everhard knew rather sadly that they would, that a storm would destroy the fleet and drown who knows how many young men. But he let Taktai continue. The Kar Khan realized we must learn more about the islands. Perhaps we should try to establish a base somewhere north of Hokkaido. Then, too, we have long heard rumors about more distant lands. Fishermen are blown off course now and then and have glimpses. Traders from Siberia speak of a strait and a country beyond. 
The Ka Khan got four ships with Chinese crews and told me to take a hundred Mongol warriors and see what I could discover. We followed two chains of islands, one after another, said Taktai. They were bleak enough, but we could stop here and there, let the horses out, and learn something from the natives. We did find out that there are two mainlands, Siberia and another, which come so close together up north that a man might cross in a skin boat or walk across the ice in winter sometimes. Finally, we came to the new mainland, a big country, forests, much game and seals. Too rainy, though. Our ship seemed to want to continue, so we followed the coast, more or less. Everard visualized a map. If you go first along the Kuriels and then the Aleutians, you're never far from land. Also, the current urged them along. Tuk Tai had discovered Alaska before he quite knew what had happened. Since the country grew ever more hospitable as he coasted south, he passed up Puget Sound and proceeded clear to the Chehalis River. We set up camp when the war was waning, said the Mongol. The tribes thereabouts are backward but friendly. They gave us all the food, women, and help we could ask for. In return, our sailors taught them some tricks of fishing and boat building. We wintered there, learned some of the languages, and made trips inland. Everywhere were tales of huge forests and plains where herds of wild cattle blackened the earth. We saw enough to know the stories were true. I've never been in so rich a land. His eyes gleamed tigerishly. And so few dwellers who don't even know the use of iron. Noyon, murmured Lee warningly. He nodded his head very slightly towards the patrolman. Tok Tai clamped his mouth shut. Lee turned to Everard and said, There were also rumors of a golden realm far to the south. We felt it our duty to investigate this, as well as explore the country in between. We had not looked for the honor of being met by your eminent selves. The honor is all ours, Everhard purred. Then, putting on his gravest face, My lord of the Golden Empire, who may not be named, has sent us in a spirit of friendship. It would grieve him to see you meet disaster. We come to warn you. Tok Tai sat up straight. What in the hells is this? In the hells indeed, Noyan. Pleasant though this country seems, it lies under a curse. Tell him, my brother. Sandoval took over. His yarn had been concocted with an eye to exploiting the superstition which still lingered in the half-civilized Mongols without generating too much Chinese skepticism. There were really two great southern kingdoms, he explained. Their own lay far away. Its rival was somewhat north and east of it, with a citadel on the plains. Both states possessed immense powers. Call them sorcery or subtle engineering as you wished. The northerly empire, bad guys, considered all this territory as its own and would not tolerate a foreign expedition. Its scouts were certain to discover the Mongols before long and would annihilate them with thunderbolts. The benevolent southern land of good guys could offer no protection, could only send emissaries warning the Mongols to turn home again. Why have the natives not spoken of these overlords? asked Lee shrewdly. Has every little tribesman in the jungles of Burma heard of the Ka Khan? responded Sandoval. I am a stranger and ignorant, said Lee. Forgive me if I do not understand your talk of irresistible weapons which is the politest way I've ever been called a liar, thought Everard. Aloud, he said, I can offer a small demonstration if the Noyan has an animal that may be killed. Toktai clapped his hands and barked orders to the guard who looked in. Thereafter, they made small talk against a silence that thickened. A warrior appeared after some endless part of an hour. He said that a couple of horsemen had lassoed a deer. Would it serve the Noyan's purpose? It would. Toktai led the way out shouldering through a thick and buzzing swarm of men. Everard followed, slipping the rifle stock onto his Mauser. Care to do the job? he asked Sandoval. Christ, no. The deer, a doe, trembled by the river, the horsehair ropes about her neck. There was a blind sort of gentleness in her look at Everard. He waved back the men around her and took aim. The first slug killed her, but he kept the gun chattering till her carcass was gruesome. When he lowered his weapon, the air felt somehow rigid, 
he looked across all the thick, bandy-legged bodies, the flat, grimly controlled faces. He could smell them with unnatural sharpness, a clean odor of sweat and horses and smoke. He felt himself as non-human as they must see him. That is the least of the arms used here, he said. A soul so torn from the body would not find its way home. He turned on his heel. Sandoval followed him. Their horses had been staked out, the gear piled close by. They saddled, unspeaking, mounted and rode off into the forest. The fire blazed up in a gust of wind. Sparingly laid by a woodsman, in that moment it barely brought the two out of shadow. It sank down again to red and blue, sputtering above white coals, and darkness took the men. Nearby were their sleeping bags, their horses, the scooter. Anti-gravity sled come space-time hopper, which had brought them. Otherwise, the land was empty. Mile upon mile, human fires like their own were as small and lonely as stars in the universe. Somewhere a wolf howled. I suppose, Everard said, every cop feels like a bastard occasionally. You've just been an observer so far, Jack. Active assignments, such as I get, are often hard to accept. Yeah. Sandoval had been even more quiet than his friend. He had scarcely stirred since supper. And now this. Whatever you have to do to cancel a temporal interference, you can at least think you're restoring the original line of development. Everhard fumed on his pipe. Don't remind me that original is meaningless in this context. It's a consoling word. Uh-huh. But when our bosses, our dead Denelian supermen, tell us to interfere, we... Well, we know Toktai's people never came back to Cathay. Why should you or I have to take a hand? If they ran into hostile Indians or something and were wiped out, I wouldn't mind. At least no more than I mind any similar incident in that goddamn slaughterhouse they call human history. We don't have to kill them, you know, said Sandoval. Just make them turn back. Your demonstration this afternoon may be enough. Yeah, turn back and what? Probably perish at sea. If we didn't interfere, they'd start home later. The circumstances of the voyage would be different. Why should we take the guilt? They could even make it home, murmured Sandoval. What? Everard started. The way Taktai was talking, I'm sure he plans to go back on a horse, not on those ships. As he's guessed, Bering Strait is easy to cross. The Aleuts do it all the time. Mance, I'm afraid it isn't enough simply to spare them. But they aren't going to get home. We know that. Suppose they do make it. Sandoval began to talk a bit louder and much faster. The night wind roared around his words. Let's play with ideas a while. Suppose Toktai pushes on southeastward. It's hard to see what could stop him. His men can live off the country, even the deserts, far more handily than Coronado or any of those boys. He hasn't terribly far to go before he reaches a high-grade Neolithic people, the agricultural Pueblo tribes. That will encourage him all the more. He'll be in Mexico before August. Mexico's just as dazzling now as it was, it will be, in Cortez's day, and even more tempting. The Aztecs and Toltecs are still settling who's to be master, with any number of other tribes hanging around ready to help a newcomer against both. The Spanish guns made, w will make, no real difference, as you'll recall if you've read Diaz. The Mongols are as superior man for man as any Spaniard. Not that I imagine Tok Tai would wade right in. He'd doubtless be very polite, spend the winter, learn everything he could. Next year, he'd go back north, proceed home, and report to Kublai that some of the richest, most gold-stuffed territory on Earth was wide open for conquest. Well, how about the other Indians? Put in Everard. I'm vague on them. The Mayan New Empire is at its height. A tough nut to crack, but a correspondingly rewarding one. I should think once the Mongols got established in Mexico, there'd be no stopping them. And then the land. Can you visualize what a Mongol tribe would make of the Great Plains? I can't see them emigrating in hordes, said Everard. There was that about Sandoval's voice which made him uneasy and defensive. 
Too much Siberia and Alaska in the way. Worse obstacles have been overcome. I don't mean that they'd pour in all at once. It might take them a oh, few centuries to start mass immigration, as it will take the Europeans. I can imagine a string of clans and tribes being established in the course of some years, all down western North America. Remember, the Yuan dynasty is due to be overthrown in less than a century. That'll put additional pressure on the Mongols in Asia to go elsewhere. And Chinese will come here, too, to farm and share in the gold. I should think, if you don't mind my saying so, Everard broke in softly, that you, of all people, wouldn't want to hasten the conquest of America. It'd be a different conquest, said Sandoval. I don't care about the Aztecs. If you study them, you'll agree that Cortez did Mexico a favor. It'd be rough on other, more harmless tribes, too, for a while. And yet, the Mongols aren't such devils, are they? A Western background prejudices us. We forget how much torture and massacre the Europeans were enjoying at the same time. The Mongols are quite a bit like old Romans, really. Same practice of depopulating areas that resist, but respecting the rights of those who make submission. Same armed protection and competent government. Same unimaginative, uncreative national character. But the same vague awe and envy of true civilization. The Pax Mongolica right now unites a bigger area and brings more different peoples into stimulating contact than that piddling Roman Empire ever imagined. As for the Indians, remember the Mongols are herdsmen. There won't be anything like the unsolvable conflict between hunter and farmer that made the white man destroy the Indian. The Mongol hasn't got race prejudices either. And after a little fighting, the average Navajo, Cherokee, Seminole, Algonquin, Chippewa, Dakota will be glad to submit and become allied. Why not? He'll get horses, sheep, cattle, textiles, metallurgy. He'll outnumber the invaders and be on much more nearly equal terms with them than with white farmers and machine age industry. And there'll be the Chinese, I repeat, leavening the whole mixture, teaching civilization and sharpening wits. Sandoval stopped. Everhard listened to the gallows creak of branches in the winds. He looked into the night for a long while before he said, It could be. Of course, we'd have to stay in this century till the crucial point was passed. Our own world wouldn't exist, wouldn't ever have existed. It wasn't such a hell of a good world anyway, said Sandoval as if in a dream. You might think about your old parents. They'd never have been born either. They lived in a tumble-down Hogan. I saw my father crying once because he couldn't buy shoes for us in winter. My mother died of TB. Everard sat unstirring. It was Sandoval who shook himself and jumped to his feet with a rattling kind of laugh. <laughs> oh, what have I been mumbling? It was just a yarn, Mance. Let's turn in. Shall I take first watch? Everard agreed, but lay long awake. The scooter had jumped two days futureward and now hovered invisibly far above to the naked eye. Around it, the air was thin and sharply cold. Everard shivered as he adjusted the electronic telescope. Even at full magnification, the caravan was little more than specks toiling across green immensity. But no one else in the Western Hemisphere could have been riding horses. He twisted in the saddle to face his companion. So now what? Sandoval's broad countenance was unreadable. Well, if our demonstration didn't work... It sure as hell didn't. I'd swear they're moving south twice as fast as before. Why? I'd have to know all of them a lot better than I do as individuals to give you a real answer, Mance. But essentially, it must be that we challenge their courage. A warlike culture, nerve and hardihood, its absolute virtues. What choice have they but to go on? 
But Mongols aren't idiots. They didn't conquer everybody in sight by bull's strength, but by jolly well understanding military principles better. Taktai should retreat, report to the emperor what he saw, and organize a bigger expedition. The men at the ships can do that, Sandoval reminded. Now that I think about it, I see how grossly we underestimated Taktai. He must have set a date, presumably next year, for the ships to try and go home if he doesn't return. When he finds something interesting along the way, like us, he can dispatch an Indian with a letter to the base camp. Everard nodded. It occurred to him that he had been rushed into this job all the way down the line, with never a pause to plan it as he should have done. Hence this botch. But how much blame must fall on the subconscious reluctance of John Sandoval? After a minute, Everhard said, they may even have smelled something fishy about us. The Mongols were always good at psychological warfare. Could be, but what's our next move? Everard thought, swoop down from above, fire a few blasts from the 41st century energy gun mounted in this time cycle, and that's the end. No, by God. They can send me to the exile planet before I'll do any such thing. There are decent limits. He said, we'll rig up a more impressive demonstration. And if it flops, too? Shut up, give it a chance. Well, I was just wondering. The wind harried under Sandoval's words. Why not cancel the expedition instead? Go back in time a couple of years and persuade Kublai Khan it isn't worthwhile sending explorers eastward. Then all this would have never happened. You know patrol regs forbid us to make historical changes. What do you call this we're doing? Something specifically ordered by Supreme HQ. Perhaps to correct some interference elsewhere, else when? How should I know? I'm only a step on the evolutionary ladder. They have abilities a million years hence that I can't even guess at. Father knows best, murmured Sandoval. Everard set his jaws and sent the scooter gliding forward. See that hill, he pointed after a while? It's on Toktai's line of march, but I think he'll camp a few miles short of it tonight, down in that little meadow by the stream. The hill will be in his plain view, though. Let's set up shop on it. The hill bore a sparse crown of pine trees. Everhard landed the scooter among them and began to unload boxes from its sizable baggage compartments. After a while, the Indian broke his silence. This isn't my line of work. What are you rigging? Everard patted the small machine he had half assembled. It's adapted from a weather control system used in the cold centuries era upstairs. A potential distributor. It can make some of the damnedest lightning you ever saw, with thunder to match. Hmm, the great Mongol weakness. Suddenly Sandoval grinned. <laughs> you win. Might as well relax and enjoy this. Fix us supper, will you, Jack, while I put the gimmick together? No fire, naturally. Oh, yes, I also have a mirage projector. If you'll change clothes and put on a, a hood or something at the appropriate moment so you can't be recognized, I'll paint a picture of you a mile high, half as ugly as life. Or well, how about a PA system? Navajo chants can be fairly alarming if you don't know it's just a yebby chair or whatever. Coming up. The day waned. It grew murky under the pines. The air was chill and pungent. At last, Everard devoured a sandwich and watched through his binoculars as the Mongols stopped at the campsite he had predicted. Early stars glittered above snow peaks. It was time to begin work. Got our horses tethered, Jack? They might panic. I'm fairly sure the Mongol horses will. Okay, here goes. Everard flipped a main switch and squatted by the dimly lit control dials of his apparatus. First, there was the palest blue flicker between earth and sky. Then the lightnings began. Tongue after forked tongue leaping, trees smashed at a blow, the mountainsides rocking under their noise. Everard threw out ball lightning, spheres of flame which whirled trailing sparks, shooting across to the camp and exploding above it till the sky seemed white hot. Deafened and half blinded, he managed to project a sheet of fluorescing ionization. Like northern lights, the great banners curled, bloody red and bone white, hissing under the repeated thunder cracks. Sandoval trod forth. He had stripped to his pants, daubed clay on his body in archaic patterns. His face was smeared with earth and twisted into something Everard would not have known. The machine scanned him and output something which stood forth against the aurora taller than a mountain. 
it moved in a shuffling dance from horizon to horizon and back to the sky. It wailed and barked in a falsetto louder than thunder. Everard crouched beneath the lurid light, his fingers stiff on the control board. Judas Priest, if this doesn't make them quit... His mind returned to him. He even looked at his watch. Half an hour. Give them another 15 minutes in which the display tapered off. They'd surely stay in camp till dawn rather than blunder wildly out in the dark. They had that much discipline. So keep everything under wraps for several hours more, then administer the last stroke to their nerves by a single electric bolt smiting a tree right next to them. When the noise was gone, Everard said, Nice show, Jack. His voice sounded tinny and strange in his ears. I hadn't done anything like that for years, muttered Sandoval. He struck a match, startling noise in the quietness. The brief flame showed his lips gone thin. Then he shook out the match, and only his cigarette end glowed. Nobody I knew on the reservation took that stuff seriously, he went on after a moment. A few of the older men wanted us boys to learn it to keep the custom alive, to remind us we were still a people. But mostly our idea was to pick up some change by dancing for tourists. There was a longer pause. Everard doused the projector completely. Tourists, he said at last. Tonight I was dancing for a purpose. It meant something. I never felt that way before. Everard was silent. Until one of the horses, which was still nervous, whinnied. Everard looked up. Night met his eyes. Did you hear anything, Jack? The flashlight beam speared him. For an instant, he stared blinded at it. Then he sprang erect, cursing and snatching for his stun pistol. A shadow ran from behind one of the trees. It struck him in the ribs. He lurched back. The beam gun flew to his hand. He shot at random. The flashlight swept about once more. Everhard glimpsed Sandoval. The Navajo had not donned his weapons again. Unarmed, he dodged the sweep of a Mongol blade. The swordsman ran after him. Sandoval reverted to patrol judo. He went to one knee. Clumsy afoot, the Mongol slashed, missed, and ran straight into a shoulder block to the belly. Sandoval rose with the blow. The heel of his hand jolted upward to the Mongol's chin. The helmeted head snapped back. Sandoval chopped a hand at the Adam's apple, yanked the sword from its owner's grasp, turned and parried a cut from behind. A voice yammered above the Mongol yipping, giving orders. Everard backed away. He had knocked one attacker out with a bolt from his pistol. There were others between him and the scooter. He circled to face them. A lariat curled around his shoulders. It tightened with one expert heave. He went over. Four men piled on him. He saw half a dozen lance butts crack down on Sandoval's head. Then there wasn't time for anything but fighting. Twice he got to his feet, but they dragged him down and hit him with fists, boots, dagger pummels. He never quite lost consciousness, but he finally stopped caring. Toktai struck camp before dawn. The first son saw his troop wind between scattered copses on a broad valley floor. The land was turning flat and arid, the mountains to the right farther away, fewer snow peaks visible, and those ghostly in a pale sky. The hardy small Mongol horses trotted ahead, plop of hooves, squeak and jingle of harness. Everard's brain felt sandy. They had left his hands free, but lashed his ankles to the stirrups, and the cord chafed. The projector and the scooter lay back at the hill. Toktai would not take any risks with those things of power. Hooves thudded rapidly. One of the bowmen flanking Everhard grunted and moved his pony a little aside. Li Tai Chong rode close. The patrolman gave him a dull stare. Well, he said, I fear your friend will not awaken again answered the Chinese. I made him a little more comfortable. But lying strapped on an improvised litter between two ponies, unconscious, Everard thought. Yes, concussion, when they clubbed him last night. A patrol hospital could put him to right soon enough, but the nearest patrol office is in Cambaluc, and I can't see Toktai letting me go back to the scooter and use its radio. 
John Sandoval is going to die here 650 years before he was born. Everard looked into cool brown eyes, interested, not unsympathetic, but alien to him. It was no use, he knew, but one had to try. Can you at least not make Taktai understand what ruin he's going to bring on himself, on his whole people by this? Lee stroked his forked beard. It is plain to see, honored sir, that your nation has arts unknown to us. But what of it? The barbarians took many kingdoms superior to them in every way but fighting skill. Now already we know that you, uh, amended the truth when you spoke of a hostile empire near these lands. Why should your king try to frighten us away with a falsehood if he did not have reason to fear us? Everard spoke with care. Our glorious emperor dislikes bloodshed, but if you force him to strike you down... Please, Lee looked pained. He waved one slender hand as if brushing off an insect. Say what you will to talk Tai, and I shall not interfere, but it would not sadden me to return home. I came only under imperial orders, but let us two, speaking confidentially, not insult each other's intelligence. Do you not see, eminent lord, that there is no possible harm with which you can threaten these men? Death they despise. Even the most lingering torture must kill them in time. Toktai sees eternal shame if he turns back at this stage of events, and a good chance of eternal glory and uncountable wealth if he continues. Everard sighed. His own humiliating capture had indeed been the turning point. The Mongols had been very near bolting at the Thunder Show. Toktai charged the source as much in horror as defiance. A few men and horses had been able to come along. Lee himself was partly responsible. Scholar, skeptic, familiar with sleight of hand and pyrotechnic displays, the Chinese had helped hearten Toktai to attack before one of those thunderbolts did strike home. Everard thought, the truth of the matter is, son, we misjudge these people. We should have taken along a specialist who'd have an intuitive feeling for the nuances of this culture. But no, we assumed a brain full of facts would be enough. And now what? A patrol relief expedition may show up eventually, but Jack will be dead in another day or two. Quite probably I'll be also. So I advise you most sincerely not to attempt any more deceptions. What? Everard turned back to Lee. You do understand, do you not, said the Chinese, that our native guides did flee, that you are now taking their place, but we expect to meet other tribes before long. Establish communication? Everard nodded a throbbing head. The sunlight pierced his eyes. And obtain guides from stage to stage, as we did before, continued Lee. Any misdirection you may have given will soon be apparent. Taktai will punish it in most uncivilized ways. On the other hand, faithful service will be rewarded. You may hope in time to rise high in the provincial court after the conquest. Everard sat unmoving. The casual boast was like an explosion in his mind. He had been assuming the patrol would send another force. Obviously, something was going to prevent Taktai's return. But was it so obvious? Why had this interference been ordered at all, if there were not, in some paradoxical way his 20th century logic couldn't grasp, an uncertainty, a shakiness in the continuum right at this point? Judas in hell. Perhaps the Mongol expedition was going to succeed. Perhaps all the future of an American Khanate, which Sandoval had not quite dared dream of, was the real future. At sundown, their unmerciful pace had brought the expedition into sagebrush and greasewood country. The hills were steep and brown. Dust smoked under hooves. Silvery green bushes grew sparse, sweetening the air when bruised, but offering little else. Everard helped lay Sandoval on the ground. The Navajo's eyes were closed, his face sunken and hot. Sometimes he tossed and muttered a bit. Everard squeezed water from a wetted cloth past the cracked lips, but could do nothing more. 
the Mongols established themselves more gaily than of late, they had overcome two great sorcerers and suffered no further attack, and the implications were growing upon them. They went about their chores chattering to each other. Everard remained with Sandoval, near the middle of the camp. Two guards had been posted on him, who sat with strong bows a few yards away but didn't talk. Now and then one of them would get up to tend the small fire. Presently silence fell on their comrades too. A footfall crunched dry soil. Toktai moved into the light, his head bare above a mantle and halted. Everard looked up and then down again. The Noyan stared a while at Sandoval. Finally, almost gently, he said, I do not think your friend will live till next sunset. Everard grunted. Have you any medicines which might help? asked Toktai. There are some queer things in your saddlebags. I have a remedy against infection and another against pain, said Everhard mechanically. But for a cracked skull, he must be taken to skillful physicians. Toktai sat down and held his hands to the fire. I'm sorry we have no surgeons along. You could let us go, said Everard without hope. My chariot back at the last camp could get him to help in time. Now you know I can't do that, Toktai chuckled. His pity for the dying man flickered out. After all, Ibera, you started the trouble. Since it was true, the patrolman made no retort. I don't hold it against you. In fact, I'm still anxious to be friends. If I weren't, I'd stop for a few days and wring all you know out of you. Everhard flared up. Well, you could try. And succeed, I think, with a man who has to carry medicine against pain. His grin was wolfish. Oh, now, Toktai clapped him on the back. Can't you tell me even a little? There's no blood feud between us. Let's be friends. Everard jerked a thumb at Sandoval. It's a shame, that, said Toktai. But he would keep on resisting an officer of the Kar Khan. Come, let's have a drink together, Iborar. I'll send my man for a bag of cumis. You could let me have my whiskey. Everard looked at Sandoval again and felt the cold creep inward. God, but I could use that. Hey, eh? A drink of our own. We had some there in our saddlebags. Well, Toktai hesitated. Very well. Come along and we'll fetch it. The guards followed their chief and their prisoner, through the brush up to a pile of assorted gear also under guard. One of the sentries ignited a stick in his fire to give Everard some light. The patrolman's back muscles tensed. Arrows were aimed at him now, drawn to the barb, but he squatted and went through his own stuff, careful not to move fast. When he had both canteens of scotch, he returned to his own place. Tok Tai sat across the fire. He watched Everard pour a shot into the canteen cup and toss it off. Smells odd, he said. Try. The Mongol sniffed dubiously, looked back at Everard, paused, and then raised the bottle to his lips with a bravura gesture. Woo! Everard scrambled to catch the flask before too much was spilled. Toktai gasped and spat. One guardsman knocked an arrow. The other sprang to lay a hard hand on Everard's shoulder. It's not poison. It's only too strong for him. You see? I'll drink some more myself. Toktai waved the guards back and glared from watery eyes. <laughs> what do you make that of? He choked. Dragon's blood? Barley. Everard didn't feel like explaining distillation. He poured himself another slug. Go ahead, drink your mare's milk. Toktai smacked his lips. It does warm you up, doesn't it? <laughs> like pepper. He reached out a grimy hand. Give me some more. Everard took his time. Toktai grew impatient. Hurry along there. No, give me the other flask. Very well, you're the chief. But I beg you, don't try to match me draft for draft. You can't do it. What do you mean I can't do it? Why, well, I've drunk 20 men senseless in Karakorum. Toktai poured down a couple of ounces more. Everard sipped with care. Suddenly he was glimpsing what might be a way out. Here, it's a, it's a cold night, he said, and offered his canteen to the nearest guardsman. 
You lads have one to keep warm. Toktai looked up a trifle muzzily. Good stuff, this, he objected. Toktai poured a further dose into himself. He wagged his finger. That's the trouble being a Mongol. You're so hardy you can't get drunk. <laughs> Are you bragging or complaining, said Everard. The first warrior fanned his tongue, resumed a stance of alertness, and passed the bottle to his companion. Toktai hoisted the other canteen again. Ah! He stared owlish. That was fine. Give him back his liquor, men. Everard's throat tightened, but he managed to leer. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'll want some more, he said. I'm glad that you realize you can't take it. What do you mean? Toktai glared at him. No such thing as too much, not for a Mongol. He glugged afresh. The first guardsman received the other flask and took a hasty snort before it should be too late. Everard sucked in a shaken breath. It might work out after all. It might. When Toktai folded, Everard alone noticed. The Noyon slid from a cross-legged to a recumbent position. The fire sputtered up long enough to show a silly smile on his face. Everard squatted wire tense. The end of one century came a few minutes later. He reeled, went on all fours, and began to jettison his dinner. The other one turned, blinking, fumbling after a sword. What's the matter? he groaned. What have you done, poison? Everard moved. He had hopped over the fire and fallen on Toktai before the last guard realized it. The Mongol stumbled forward, crying out. Everard found Toktai's sword. It flashed from the scabbard as he bounded up. The warrior got his own blade aloft. Everard didn't like to kill a nearly helpless man. He stepped close, knocked the other weapon aside, and his fist clopped. The Mongol sank to his knees, wretched, and slept. Everard bounded away. Men stirred in the dark, calling. Somebody took a brand from an almost extinct fire and whirled it till it flared. Everard went flat on his belly. A warrior pelted by, not seeing him in the brush. He glided toward deeper darkness. A yell behind him, a machine gun volley of curses told that someone had found the Noyam. Everard stood up and began to run. The horses had been hobbled and turned out under guard as usual. They were a dark mass on the plain, which lay gray-white beneath a sky crowded with sharp stars. Everard saw one of the Mongol watchers gallop to meet him. He crouched, visible as a hunched and cloaked shape. The Mongol reined in with a spurt of dust. Everard sprang. He got hold of the pony's bridle before he was recognized. Then the sentry yelled and drew sword. He hewed downward, but Everard was on the left side. The blow from above came awkwardly, easily parried. Everard chopped in return and felt his edge go into meat. The horse reared in alarm. Its rider fell from the saddle. He rolled over and staggered up again, bellowing. Everard already had one foot in a pan-shaped stirrup. The Mongol limped toward him, blood running black in that light from a wounded leg. Everard mounted and laid the flat of his own blade on the horse's crupper. He got going toward the herd. Another rider pounded to intercept him. Everard ducked. An arrow buzzed where he had been. The stolen pony plunged, fighting its unfamiliar burden. Everard needed a minute to get it under control again. The archer might have taken him then by coming up and going at it hand to hand, but habit sent the man past at a gallop, shooting. He missed in the dimness. Before he could turn, Everhard was out of night view. The patrolman uncoiled a lariat at the saddlebow and broke into the skittish herd. He roped the nearest animal, which accepted it with blessed meekness. Leaning over, he slashed the hobbles with his sword and rode off, leading the remount. They came out the other side of the herd and started north. A stern chase is a long chase, Everhard told himself inappropriately. But they're bound to overhaul me if I don't lose them. Let's see, if I remember my geography, the lava beds lie northwest of here. He cast a glance behind. He felt a chill, deeper than the night cold. But he eased his pace. There was no more reason for hurry. That must be Mance Everard, who had returned to the patrol vehicle and ridden it south in space and backward in time to this same instant. That was cutting it fine, he thought. Patrol doctrine frowned on helping oneself thus. Too much danger of a close causal loop or of tangling past and future. But in this case, I'll get away with it. No reprimands, even. 
because it's to rescue Jack Sandoval, not myself. I've already gotten free. Besides, what's this whole mission been except the future doubling back to create its own past? Without us, the Mongols might well have taken over America, and then there'd never have been any us. And what am I doing back there? He asked aloud. The answer came to him, and he eased a little, fell into the rhythm of his horses and started eating miles. He wanted to get this over with, but what he must do turned out to be less bad than he had feared. Tok Tai and Li Tai Chung never came home, but that was not because they perished at sea or in the forests. It was because a sorcerer rode down from heaven and killed all their horses with thunderbolts and smashed and burned their ships in the river mouth. No Chinese sailor would venture onto those tricky seas in whatever clumsy vessel could be built here. No Mongol would think it possible to go home on foot. Indeed, it probably wasn't. The expedition would stay, marry into the Indians, live out their days. Chinook, Tlingit, Nootka, all the potlatch tribes, with their big seagoing canoes, lodges, and copper working, furs and cloths and haughtiness. Everhard nodded to himself. So much for that. What was harder to take than the thwarting of Tok Tai's bloodthirsty ambitions was the truth about his own core, which was his own family and nation and reason for living. The distant supermen turned out to be not quite such idealists after all. They weren't merely safeguarding a perhaps divinely ordained history which led to them. Here and there, they too meddled to create their own past. Don't ask if there was ever any original scheme of things. Keep your mind shut. Regard the rutted road mankind had to travel and tell yourself that if it could be better in places, in other places it could be worse. It may be a crooked game, said Everard, but it's the only one in town. His voice came so loud in that huge rhyme white land that he didn't speak any more. He clucked at his horse and rode a little faster northward. You've been listening to The Guardians of Time by Poole Anderson, read by Fred Melamud, directed by Stuart Lee, and produced by Family Radio Programming. For a complete listing of our other programs, send for our free catalog. Just write to us at the address you'll find on the label of this cassette.